Hello, everybody. It is my pleasure today to introduce Professor Antonios Mikus. Antonios Mikus is the Louis Calder Professor of Bioengineering and Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at Rice University. He is the director of the J.W. Cox Laboratory for Biomedical Engineering and the director of the Center for Excellence in Tissue Engineering, also at Rice University. He received his engineering diploma in 1983 from Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, Greece, and his PhD in 1988 in chemical engineering from Purdue University. He was a postdoctoral researcher at MIT and the Harvard Medical School before joining the Rice faculty in 1992 as an assistant professor. Mikus's research focuses on the synthesis, processing, and evaluation of new biomaterials for use as scaffolds for tissue engineering, as carriers for drug delivery, and as non-viral vectors for gene therapy. His work has led to development of novel orthopedic, dental, cardiovascular, neurologic, and ophthalmologic biomaterials. He is the author of over 420 publications and 25 patents. His work has been cited over 19,000 times. He is the editor of 14 books and the author of a textbook on biomaterials. Mikus has mentored 50 graduate students, as well as 33 postdoctoral fellows, 21 of whom remain still in academia. Mikus is a fellow of many societies, such as the Controlled Release and the Biomedical Engineering Society. He has been recognized by too many awards to be enumerated today, including the Founders Award and the Clemson Award for Contribution to the Literature of the Society for Biomaterials, and the Marshall R. Urist Award for Excellence in Tissue Regeneration Research. Mikus is also a member of the editorial boards of numerous journals, as well as a founding editor and editor-in-chief of journals such as Tissue Engineering. He is currently the president of the North American Tissue Engineering and the Generative Medicine International Society. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Professor Mikus. Well, thank you very much uh, for the very kind introduction, and uh, th many thanks uh, to NIH uh, for this uh, great honor uh, to be uh, here with you and uh, be a part of the uh, Wednesday afternoon uh, lecture uh, series. I have been uh, very fortunate in uh, my career uh, at Rice University uh, to interact uh, with uh, great colleagues, uh, great collaborators, uh, not only at Rice University, at institutions in uh, Houston, at uh, Baylor College of Medicine, the University of Texas Health Science Center, and MD Anderson Cancer Center, but also uh, collaborate uh, with people across uh, the country and around uh, the world, and I'll try to, uh, to mention uh, my collaborators and the impact uh, that they had in our uh, uh, progress over the years uh, during my presentation. Most importantly, in the beginning of uh, my presentation, I need uh, to acknowledge the significant contribution of uh, current and uh, past uh, uh, graduate students, uh, and the undergraduate students, and postdoctoral uh, fellows in their work, our work over the years that I'll try uh, to share with you today. So our work uh, has focused on the development of uh, biomaterials uh, for uh, tissue engineering applications. Uh, the tissue engineering field is a relatively young field. Uh, the term tissue engineering was uh, defined over uh, 20 years ago, uh, 20 years ago or even 10 years ago, uh, people talk about the great potential of uh, uh, tissue engineering, uh, the promise of tissue engineering uh, to revolutionize medicine. Uh, this uh, promise is uh, no longer uh, science fiction, it's a reality. Uh, we have uh, products that are currently regulated by the Food and Drug Administration in the United States uh, for a number of indications, and there is a lot of uh, activity and a lot of uh, uh, interest in developing uh, uh, products uh, for uh, many other uh, tissues uh, in uh, the human uh, body. So our work um, uh, has uh, focus on uh, orthopedic applications, the regeneration of uh, bone and um, uh, cartilage tissue. However, uh, we, have, uh, we have interest in the engineering and the regeneration of many other tissues, including uh, ophthalmologic tissues, uh, neurologic tissues, and uh, uh, also uh, cardiovascular uh, tissues. I have a small difficulty advancing the slides. Is 
is there something that I need to do from here or I should signal you? Oh, I can do it. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. My apologies. Uh, so currently, uh, there is extensive research in uh, many academic and uh, clinical centers uh, for the engineering of uh, uh, most uh, uh, tissues in the human body. And although most of the early successes here focused on skin and musculoskeletal applications, uh, there is essentially work to regenerate every single tissue in the human uh, body. The tissue engineering uh, paradigm involves the use of um, uh, three uh, main uh, components. Uh, it involves uh, the use of uh, uh, biomaterials, uh, the use of uh, bioactive molecules that I would collectively call uh, drugs, and also the use uh, uh, of uh, cells. And there have been uh, many such uh, combinations that uh, have been investigated over the years uh, for the engineering of uh, uh, different uh, tissues. Uh, biomaterials uh, play a very important uh, role in, this, uh, t in the tissue engineering um, uh, paradigm. Uh, there are different types of biomaterials that have been investigated over the years, uh, from polymers to ceramics, even uh, metals. Uh, our focus and expertise has been in the area of uh, polymeric biomaterials and uh, synthetic uh, polymers, as well as natural polymers, uh, have been investigated uh, uh, for different applications. And uh, there is an advantage and disadvantage of using one or the other, something that I will try uh, to address uh, during my presentation. There are many different types of uh, bioactive molecules that uh, have been investigated as part of a tissue engineering uh, strategy. Uh, that can range uh, from uh, proteins to protein fragments, uh, peptides, even uh, plasmids. And uh, these uh, molecules uh, have been used in an effort uh, to induce a regenerative cascade. Uh, this can be differentiation of factors, angiogenic factors in general. Any molecule that can have an effect in tissue regeneration uh, has uh, been investigated. One of the main components of the uh, tissue engineering uh, paradigm uh, are the cells. And um, at the early stages uh, of uh, the field, uh, there was a lot of uh, focus on the use of uh, committed, uh, differentiated cells as part of tissue engineering. And uh, now I would say the main focus has been on the use of uh, stem cells or progenitor cells as part of a tissue engineering strategy. Uh, the role of biomaterials uh, has uh, shifted uh, from that of a scaffold that can provide the means of organization of, uh, the, for the creation of a new tissue to a means of providing the signals that are needed for the progenitor cells uh, for their uh, differentiation and the guidance and the formation of um, a new uh, tissue. And during my presentation that I'll try to discuss examples of different uh, uh, cell populations and uh, their uh, role uh, in uh, tissue engineering. Over the years, uh, we and others uh, have uh, focused on the fabrication of three-dimensional uh, scaffolds of biodegradable polymers that can be used as templates uh, to facilitate the three-dimensional culture of uh, uh, cells and also the guidance for the formation of a new uh, tissue. Over the years, uh, we and others uh, have developed uh, new processing techniques uh, with to produce uh, polymers with control porosity, control pore architecture, control mechanical properties, and control degradation characteristics. Uh, here, I must be doing something wrong that I apologize. Uh, here uh, we see examples of uh, different uh, structures and uh, different uh, uh, morphologies that one can fabricate uh, with different processing techniques. An example of a powder credible polymer scaffold fabricated with a particulate uh, leaching technique. Another example of a scaffold fabricated with a high internal phase emulsion technique. And another example of a scaffold that is fabricated by electrospinning. There are myriads of processing techniques that uh, one can use again uh, to fabricate um, uh, three-dimensional uh, scaffolds with control uh, physical chemical uh, properties as needed uh, for different applications. And the two of the most important properties of these uh, scaffolds uh, have uh, been the, the 
poor architecture as uh, well as the degradation of properties. Uh, we and others over the years uh, have shown that the poor architecture uh, can be used to modulate the differentiation of cells and also the generation of a new tissue. And the degradation properties are very important as one is trying to match the degradation of the scaffold with the regeneration of a new tissue and the deposition of extracellular matrix. Here we have an example uh, of, um, that involves the seeding of mesenchymal uh, stem cells that were isolated from the uh, bone marrow of an animal uh, model within the pores of a biodegradable uh, polymer scaffold. This was a slide from my uh, first uh, PhD student over 15 years ago that demonstrated the enormous potential of uh, cell scaffold constructs for the regeneration of tissues. So using imaging techniques such as confocal microscopy, one can image the growth and, um, uh, of, uh, and migration of cells within the three-dimensional structure. The color is indicative of the position of the cells in three dimensions, uh, with yellow being very close to the surface and blue deep inside the pores of the scaffold. And when one takes uh, these three-dimensional cell scaffold constructs and implants them in orthotopic or ectopic sites, one witnesses the formation of a new tissue, as it is in this case the formation of a bone like a structure following the implantation of these constructs in the mesentery of a rat uh, model. Again, this, this experiment that involved the transplantation of cells using biodegradable polymer uh, scaffolds has, have demonstrated the enormous potential of cell-based uh, therapies for the regeneration of uh, many uh, tissues in the bodies, and there are many examples in the literature that involve the use of such materials uh, for the transplantation of cells. For bone applications, one of the biggest challenges with the development of new therapeutics that rely on the use of scaffolds for cell transplantation uh, has been the fabrication of materials with mechanical properties suitable for use under load-bearing applications. To date, there are no synthetic biodegradable polymers that have mechanical uh, properties comparable uh, to those of uh, uh, human uh, bones. For this reason, uh, there have been a lot of uh, exciting work uh, reported in the literature that in, in the last five years that involves collaboration of tissue engineers and biomaterial scientists with nanotechnologists in an effort to fabricate nanocomposite materials with mechanical properties, again, suitable for human uh, bone replacement. Here we have an example from our laboratory uh, that involves um, our collaboration with uh, the group of uh, Jim uh, Tour in the chemistry department at, uh, department at Rice, and also uh, Dr. Michael Yazemski from the Mayo Clinic at Ro in Rochester, Minnesota. It uh, involves the fabrication of a nanocomposite of a biodegradable polymer uh, polypropylene uh, fumarate together with single wall carbon nanotubes. Uh, nanocomposites of biodegradable polymers with uh, single wall carbon nanotubes exhibit excellent mechanical properties that are uh, comparable uh, to those of um, uh, human uh, bones that hold a great uh, uh, promise uh, for the translation of the work into the clinic. The biggest challenge in fabricating uh, these nanocomposites has been the nanodispersion of the nanomaterials within the bulk of the polymer matrix. Uh, for this reason, uh, we and others have developed uh, chemistries to functionalize the surface of the uh, nanomaterials, in this particular case, the carbon nanotubes, to prevent their aggregation and also the nano dispersion to facilitate their nano dispersion within a polymerizing uh, polymer matrix. Although these materials hold great promise uh, for regenerative medicine applications, one of their biggest challenges and the biggest concern with these uh, materials is their biological fate. Uh, what will happen to, uh, with uh, these materials after implantation? These are non-degradable materials. They do not break down in a biological environment. Uh, this particular carbon nanotubes, and the question is whether they will be excreted uh, by the body or whether they will be passively integrated with the surrounding tissue or whether they will migrate into leaf nodes and become carcinogenic. There is extensive research to in further investigate the, bio the biological fate of these uh, materials. Nevertheless, uh, physical chemical uh, properties of materials that incorporate these nanostructures are phenomenal. It's not only the physical chemical properties, but also the biological properties of these materials that have been enhanced. And this is an example of a recent uh, study 
uh, a recent collaboration of our laboratory with that of Dr. John Jans at the University of Nijmegen in the Netherlands that involves uh, the assessment of the biocompatibility of nanocomposite scaffolds of ultra-short uh, carbon uh, nanotubes um, embedded uh, within a polypropylene uh, fumarate uh, matrix. The objective of the study was to assess the biocompatibility or the tissue response to the implantation of the material. And here we have the case of uh, the uh, polymer alone that was implanted in the femoral condyle of a rabbit uh, model. And what we found in the case of a porous polymer is an excellent response that involved a position of bone uh, tissue at the perimeter of the bow material, as shown here in the micro CT image and also shown here in the histological section, where the bow material is in the center and uh, the, what is stained as red is a trabecular structure of the surrounding bone. To our huge surprise, uh, when nanocomposites of ultra-short carbon nanotubes were imp implanted in the same uh, defect, we saw uh, tissue in growth within the pores of the material, as shown here in the microcomputer tomography image and also here in the histological section. Uh, this was totally unexpected, something that was validated by uh, further studies in our laboratory and other our laboratories that show the tissue inductive uh, properties of uh, nanocomposites. Although the phenomenon is very reproducible, the molecular mechanism is still under investigation. One can speculate about the tissue inductive capacity of the material because of the increased mechanical properties, uh, because of the preferential absorption of uh, uh, molecules that are involved in bone regeneration, or because of the interplay between the inflammation as a result of the implantation of these materials and uh, bone regeneration. Nevertheless, experiments like this one have demonstrated the enhancement of the biological performance of uh, bio materials uh, because of these nanostructures. It's not only the enhancement of the physicochemical properties and the biological properties that make these materials very appealing for tissue engineering applications, but also the ability uh, to use these materials for imaging purposes, uh, more specifically uh, for cellular imaging. Uh, in collaboration with uh, Lon Wilson from the chemistry department at uh, RICE, we're able to show that uh, these materials can be loaded uh, with uh, gadolinium uh, cations, uh, and uh, these uh, materials exhibit uh, enhanced uh, uh, contrast compared to gadolinium loaded fullerenes, conventional MRI contrast agents, and here we have as a control um, uh, the uh, water. So one can use uh, structures with uh, uh, carbon nanotubes for mechanical reinforcement, for enhancement of the biological performance, but also for uh, cellular imaging with MRI. I don't want to leave uh, the impression that uh, carbon nanotubes are the only biomaterials that have been investigated for tissue engineering applications. There is uh, a lot of a great interest in developing uh, biodegradable uh, uh, nanofibers and other uh, nanostructures as part of a tissue engineering structure. Here we have an example of a multi-layer structure that is fabricated, uh, that consists of different layers of micron size uh, fibers uh, and nano size fibers. You can appreciate more the number and the, con and the uh, uh, concentration of the, and the position of the nanofibers in this image that is uh, uh, the fibers were pseudo-colored, and green are the microfibers, and yellow are the nanofibers. Uh, and one can use uh, these um, uh, multi-layer uh, structures in an effort to uh, uh, engineer complex and isotropic uh, tissues that show a zonal organization, such as alt articular cartilage. Uh, what we and other, uh, others have done in recent years is that we use this kind of structures to deliver uh, different types of molecules at different uh, zones within uh, these structures or to load uh, these uh, uh, scaffolds with uh, different uh, cell types. Uh, having nanofibers uh, within the structure of a microfiber uh, uh, structure allow us to increase uh, focal contacts, allow us to essentially provide a natural bar barrier for migration of the cells from one region to the other. And very excitingly, it allows us to alter the fluid mechanical environment when we use uh, these scaffolds within a bioreactor uh, that uh, can be used for the culture of cells and the generation of extracellular uh, metrics. 
Having said that, uh, the biggest uh, challenge in the biomaterials field in general, and especially in the use of biomaterials uh, for tissue engineering, uh, has been the evaluation and validation of strategies in a clinically relevant animal model. Uh, for the past um, uh, 10 years, our laboratory uh, has been interested in the development of clinically uh, relevant animal models that will allow us the translation of tissue engineering strategies into the clinic. Here we have uh, an example of our early efforts uh, that involve uh, the collaboration of our laboratory uh, with uh, the late uh, Alan Yasko from MD Anderson Cancer Center and Mike uh, Miller also from MD Anderson Cancer Center and Michael Yazemski at that time from the Wilford uh, Hall uh, Medical Center that involved the use of the large animal uh, model such as a sheep in an effort to generate uh, vascularized uh, bone uh, tissue uh, that uh, can be used for reconstructive uh, surgery. So the animal model involves the implantation of chambers that are filled with an osteoinductive material that is placed against the periosteum of the rib in a SIP model. In the presence of right signals present within uh, the scaffolds, progenitor cells from the periosteum will grow into the uh, scaffold and generate uh, new tissue that together with the growth of blood vessels will be highly vascularized and can be used for reconstructive purposes. One of the reasons that uh, we selected uh, the rib as uh, the anatomical site for the implantation of these uh, chambers is because one can harvest not only the bone tissue, but also the intercostal artery and vein uh, that uh, can be used for, uh, can be anastomosed at the uh, uh, target uh, site using uh, microsurgical uh, techniques. So using a material and a cellular material that is rich in biological signals, we can rely on the principle of tissue induction rather than uh, cell transplantation for the generation of new tissue within the body. The body essentially behaves as a bioreactor that uh, can be uh, transferred to another uh, region in the body uh, for reconstructive uh, purposes. Although this um, chamber that is shown here and has dimensions again of clinical relevance, that is four centimeters by one centimeter by one centimeter, in six weeks we see here the formation of a new tissue, can be used for the screening of uh, different biomaterials, we found that one can get the best quality of uh, bone tissue when one uses a morselized corticocancellus bone graft, that is autologous bone tissue that can be harvested from the same animal, can be morselized and used as a packing material to fill those uh, chambers. Uh, what we found uh, was that uh, during this process, uh, the cells that are present in the bone tissue will die, will not survive the transfer. Of course, when they're packed in the chamber and the chamber is implanted initially, the environment is avascular. However, what is left behind is the extracellular matrix that is very rich in biological uh, signals, and it is those signals within the extracellular matrix that can induce the migration and proliferation and differentiation of progenitor cells that are present in the periosteum uh, to form uh, new tissue. This particular work uh, was the inspiration and motivation at the same time uh, for us to get into the bioreactor uh, technology. So for the past seven years, our laboratory has investigated the design of new bioreactors that can be used as part of a tissue engineering strategy. Bioreactors are not new technologies um, uh, in, uh, uh, in the bioengineering field. Traditionally, bioreactors have been used uh, for uh, cell expansion or other purposes. In our cases, we are using bioreactors for the generation of extracellular metrics. Or in other words, you are using bioreactors so we can transform a relatively inert biomaterial into a material that is highly bioactive, a material that is very rich in signaling molecules that can be used for tissue engineering applications. We investigate different types of bioreactors. There are many commercially available. Uh, there are many groups that are working in the design of uh, uh, bioreactors with different features. What we found was that the only type of bioreactors that can be used to generate constructs, again of dimensions of clinical relevance, are the flow perfusion bioreactors. Uh, these are the bioreactors that rely on the flow of 
uh, media through the pores of the scaffolds so that the cells within the pores can survive uh, the culture and uh, the culture uh, uh, in, the, in the laboratory and they can generate extracellular uh, matrix. In other words, we rely on the convection of media rather than the diffusion of media uh, using uh, flow. However, in addition to this advantage, the other huge advantage of the use of flow perfusion bioreactors is the stresses that are generated because of the flow, the shear forces that are exerted on the cells that line the pores of the scaffold, and these shear forces can be used to induce the differentiation of progenitor cells along uh, different uh, uh, lineages. Uh, in a recent study in our laboratory, we see here how uh, one can use uh, bioreactor technology to essentially transform an inert biomaterial such as titanium to a material this is denoted here as titanium ECM that is very rich in signaling molecules that can be used for the differentiation of progenitor cells. So the experiment was very simple. We cultured mesenchymal stem cells that were isolated from the marrow of a rat uh, model, and we cultured those uh, cells uh, within the titanium fiber mess under a flow perfusion conditions for a period of 12 days. Uh, during uh, that time, uh, the cells differentiated. They produce extracellular matrix. And after 12 days, we decellularize the constructs. So what was left behind was the titanium fiber mess with a very fine coating uh, on the surface of the uh, titanium mess. So when we culture uh, fresh mesenchymal stem cells on these constructs under flow perfusion conditions, we experience in production of enormous amounts of extracellular matrix as the result of the signaling that was provided by the extracellular uh, matrix that was deposited on the surface of the titanium. So this is essentially a paradigm shift in the biomaterials uh, field that um, relies on uh, the use of cell culture and bioreactor uh, technologies to transform an inert biomaterial into a highly active uh, uh, biomaterial. And there is uh, a lot of activity, not only in our laboratory, but also in many other laboratories, uh, to use uh, bioreactor uh, technologies to generate extracellular uh, metrics that can be used as uh, scaffolds and in uh, tissue engineering. Now, one can generate extracellular matrix uh, by uh, culturing uh, cells in a bioreactor. However, for the past uh, uh, 10 years, our laboratory and many other laboratories have been very active in incorporating elements of the extracellular matrix, either whole molecule or protein uh, uh, fragments or peptide sequences within the bulk or the surface of uh, uh, biomaterials. And we and others uh, have uh, generated uh, many biomimetic uh, materials, that is, uh, materials that have the physical chemical characteristics of the synthetic uh, materials, such as a polymer, but materials that also incorporate uh, biologically, biological signaling uh, molecules, such as uh, peptides and protein fragments. Here we have an example uh, from our collaboration with uh, my colleague at Rice, uh, um, uh, Cindy Farah uh, Carson, that involved the isolation of a 15 amino acid uh, peptide from osteoponding. The covalent uh, conjugation of that uh, peptide within the bulk of a biodegradable polymer scaffold and the culture of mesenchymal stem cells and other cell types, including fibroblasts, on the surface of these materials. And what we found uh, was uh, we can create an environment that is conducive to the adhesion and migration of bone cells or bone progenitor uh, cells, but not fibroblasts. And that can be an ideal material for guided uh, bone regeneration for dental applications. Also, what we and others have found over the years using such biomimetic uh, materials is that one can control uh, the spreading and differentiation of um, uh, progenitor cells by simply uh, varying the ligand uh, concentration on the surface or the ligand uh, composition, again, in an effort to uh, use biomaterials as a platform to control the differentiation of uh, progenitor cells. Signaling molecules uh, can be incorporated within the bulk or the surface of biomaterials using uh, different uh, technologies. Uh, however, signaling molecules do not necessarily have to be covalently linked uh, to a biomaterial. Uh, in tissue engineering, uh, we have uh, learned a lot and we borrow many of the technologies that other colleagues in the pharmaceutical science uh, have, uh, sciences have developed for the controlled delivery of proteins and other uh, bioactive molecules. 
Uh, many drug delivery systems are part of uh, uh, tissue engineering strategies. The drug delivery system that is most popular uh, in tissue engineering strategies is that that relies on the use of particulates. Uh, microparticles and nanoparticles and nanofibers uh, find many applications in uh, tissue engineering for the controlled release of bioactive molecules. And many te new technologies uh, had to be developed uh, for the fabrication of this drug delivery system that will allow the encapsulation and the controlled release of bioactive molecules that retain their biological activity. Control release and retention of the biological activity have been the two biggest challenge, uh, challenges with these uh, drug delivery uh, systems. What we see uh, here in this uh, slide is uh, biodegradable uh, microparticles that can be loaded with um, a growth uh, factor. And uh, these uh, microparticles can release a bioactive molecule in a controlled way. They can be physically loaded or placed within the pores of the scaffold or can be embedded within the bulk of the scaffold as needed as part of uh, a tissue engineering um, uh, strategy. This uh, kind of systems allow us to deliver bioactive molecules. And over the years, uh, we and others have found that dose is a very important parameter that uh, determines the biological response. But in addition to dose, what is equally important is the release kinetics. Uh, the same molecule can have a different effect if it is released in a controlled, sustained uh, way compared to an immediate uh, uh, release uh, fashion. This is a slide from a study that involved the uh, controlled release of an osteogenic peptide, a 23 amino acid uh, uh, peptide that was isolated uh, uh, from thrombin in a non-healing uh, defect in the radius of a rabbit. So here we have the defect in the radius, uh, different scaffolds relieving different doses and different, uh, different release kinetics of these bioactive molecules were tested. And what we found was that uh, uh, we had uh, union and formation of new bone uh, tissue only when we deliver uh, this uh, bioactive uh, molecule uh, to be released in an immediate fashion. So only when the bioactive molecule was released immediately, that was to our huge surprise, we expected that the release kinetics would be very important and that a sustained release uh, will result in uh, more bone formation compared to immediate result, a release, but we found the opposite result. And the retrospect, when we examined the role of these bioactive molecules in tissue regeneration, we realize that this molecule is a chemoattractant uh, for inflammatory cells. So it's very important to release the molecule immediately to recruit the inflammatory cells to the vicinity of the defect. And it is the, inf and it is the inflammatory cells that will secrete the mediators of uh, uh, bone formation and regeneration. By no means I want to communicate the message that uh, immediate release is preferred for any biological molecule, but the message that I want to communicate is that release kinetics is very important, and one has to consider how a bioactive molecule intervenes with the tissue regeneration uh, cascade, and that will provide insight as to the optimum release uh, kinetics for tissue engineering. The other message that I want to communicate is that because of developments with um, imaging uh, techniques, now we have the ability uh, to non-destructively uh, evaluate the quality of a new tissue. So using, uh, confocal, using uh, microcomputer tomography, we can image the three-dimensional structure of the bone tissue. This is the case of the defect that did not regenerate. This is the ulna. However, in the case of regeneration, we can evaluate the quality of new tissue that involves the formation of a neocortex and the medullary canal. With advantages in imaging, we can assess not only the quantity of a new tissue, but also the quality of the tissue besides the actual uh, bone, uh, the actual mineralized matrix. For example, we can assess the quality of the blood vessels that are formed within the defect. This was our experience with the development of a critical size defect model in the mandible of um, a rabbit. So here we have a 10 millimeter bicortical uh, defect we can image, yes, the amount of uh, new bone tissue that uh, grows uh, within uh, that defect, but we can also image the number of uh, blood vessels that uh, can be formed uh, within the biomaterial uh, scaffold or in the absence of uh, the biomaterial uh, uh, within uh, that defect. So our ability to image uh, 
tissues in three dimensions in a non-destructive uh, uh, manner, and also our ability to image uh, blood vessels in three dimensions has allowed us to uh, address some basic uh, biological questions about the interplay uh, between osteogenesis and uh, uh, angiogenesis. And that was the objective of a recent study that involved the use of uh, biomaterials as carriers for different growth factors, such as vascular endothelial growth factor and bone morphogenetic protein 2, or the combination of vascular endothelial growth factor and bone morphogenetic uh, protein 2, to evaluate bone formation and regeneration in a critical size defect in the cranium of a rat model. So here, this is the 8 millimeter uh, defect. Uh, you, we can image new bone formation and also blood vessels. This is four weeks after implantation. This is the case of a polymer by itself, a polypropylene fumarate. With the delivery of the vascular endothelial growth factor, we don't see much uh, bone formation. Uh, we see a lot of bone formation when we deliver bone morphogenetic protein 2 or the combination of vascular endothelial factor, vascular endothelial growth factor and BMP2 at four weeks. Here we have the results of the quantitative analysis of uh, bone um, uh, formation. And at four weeks, we have a beneficial effect of the dual delivery of the two growth factors. However, at 12 weeks, we don't see any difference between uh, dual delivery and single delivery of uh, bone morphogenetic um, uh, protein 2. And here, with the delivery of just an angiogenic factor, we don't see much uh, bone activity. That's the same case with a material uh, control. Again, the message that I don't want to communicate is that angiogenesis is not important. Angiogenesis is very important. However, this particular animal model is not a vascularly uh, compromised uh, animal uh, model. So the delivery of angiogenic factor is sufficient uh, for bone regeneration, and uh, uh, there is no additional uh, benefit uh, with the co-delivery of an angiogenic factor. However, it's clear that uh, now, using uh, different uh, drug delivery systems, that uh, we can deliver multiple multi molecules in a controlled way as needed uh, to regenerate that particular uh, tissue. Uh, our laboratory, uh, for the past uh, 20 years, has accumulated significant expertise in the area of polymer uh, chemistry and engineering. However, we recognize that uh, polymeric materials are not the only materials uh, available, uh, especially for uh, dental, uh, craniofacial, and um, uh, orthopedic applications. Uh, ceramic materials are equally important. We have been very fortunate to collaborate with uh, John Janssen from the dental school at the University of Nijmegen, and together we developed an injectable calcium phosphate-based uh, uh, composite, uh, composite for craniofacial applications. And here you can see a scanning electron micrograph of this um, uh, composite, the continuous phase is calcium phosphate. What we have dispersed uh, here is uh, biodegradable polymer microparticles. The polymer microparticles can serve as carriers, in this particular case, for the control release of an osteogenic factor, such as uh, bone morphogenetic protein 2. But also, these biodegradable polymer microparticles can serve as porogens to generate porosity after their uh, degradation to allow for the growth of a new tissue. So here we have the results of the implantation of this uh, composite materials in the cranium of a rat model. What you see here in this histological section are these uh, circular uh, domains or uh, uh, spherical domains in three dimensions are now occupied by new bone tissue that stains uh, pink. And what stains is um, uh, red is the uh, calcium phosphate ceramic that hasn't uh, degraded uh, uh, completely. So our experience uh, over the years has been uh, certain materials have advantages and disadvantages. In the case of ceramics, we have excellent compressive mechanical properties, excellent osteoconductivity, very poor tensile properties, and using a combination of ceramic materials with uh, polymers, uh, one can take advantage of the, uh, of the beneficial uh, properties of um, uh, its uh, uh, component. Although uh, drug delivery systems uh, have been uh, very popular in tissue engineering um, uh, strategies, uh, there are problems associated to, with the control release of uh, proteins, pro problems related to the stability and, uh, bio uh, and bioactivity of uh, uh, the release um, uh, proteins and their bioavailability. And for this reason, uh, we and others have also investigated the transplantation of genetically engineered uh, cells 
as a means of delivering uh, bioactive molecules locally at the defect uh, site. So rather than delivering uh, bioactive molecules, we transplant cells that overexpress a particular growth factor, and these particular cells are the manufacturing units that produce locally uh, this uh, growth factor. So here we have uh, an example of such a study that involved the genetic engineering of mesenchymal stem cells to overexpress BMP2, and what we find in a critical size defect in the uh, cranium of uh, a rat, when we transplant those cells, we have bone formation and union across the defect. Uh, this is the uh, host, uh, the edges of the host bone. This is the defect that is filled with a material. The material is a titanium fiber mesh that the cross section appears as a black dot. And when we have genetically engineered cells, we have bridging of this critical size defects. defect. I've been referring in my presentation to critical size defects. These are defects that do not heal if left untreated uh, during the lifetime of the animal. These are excellent uh, models to evaluate the um, regeneration of a combination of uh, materials uh, with uh, cells and bioactive molecules and mimic the clinical situation where a defect uh, will, not, uh, uh, will not heal uh, by itself and intervention is needed. Uh, also with uh, those studies, we were able to follow the kinetics of bone formation. Uh, bone formation can uh, originate from the cells themselves that were transplanted. However, what we found was that uh, the, these genetically engineered cells will secrete uh, factors that, including BMP2, that can uh, have an effect on the migration and differentiation of progenitor cells from the underlying uh, uh, dura. So there is a lot of activity now uh, in marrying the advances in tissue engineering with those in uh, genetic uh, engineering uh, using uh, uh, genetically engineered cells. And uh, the genetically engineered cells uh, can uh, be engineered uh, uh, using uh, uh, viral vectors or non-viral vectors. Uh, although viral vectors have been have uh, higher uh, transfection efficiency compared to uh, non-viral vectors uh, in vitro, uh, because of safety reasons uh, for in vivo applications, there is a lot of interest and activity in the tissue engineering community in delivering uh, locally non-viral vectors in an effort to transfer affect uh, cells uh, locally to produce uh, the therapeutic molecules. Uh, for this reason, uh, over the years, uh, we and others uh, have investigated uh, the synthesis of new uh, biomaterials that can essentially behave as um, non-viral uh, vectors for gene delivery, materials that are uh, mainly polycationic uh, polymers that can be used to complex uh, plasmid uh, uh, DNA, and it is this uh, complexes that uh, when delivered, uh, they can uh, transfect the cells. This is an example, one of the uh, many uh, materials that have been proposed over the years. It's a conjugate of uh, polyethylene amine together with hyaluronic acid. Uh, polyethylene amine is the gold standard of uh, uh, polymeric uh, non-viral vector. However, it's a material that exhibits uh, high cytotoxicity, and many people relate the high, high cytotoxicity to the high uh, transfection efficiency. The reason that we conjugated uh, this uh, hyaluronic acid uh, to the polyethylene amine is to use a mechanism uh, for targeting uh, for these uh, uh, conjugates, but also in an effort to reduce the cytotoxicity of the material. And what we found was that uh, these uh, conjugates uh, can result in enhanced viability of mesenchymal stem cells, of human mesenchymal uh, uh, stem cells, and so on uh, here, uh, compared to polyethylene amine, that there is significant cytotoxicity in this image. Uh, the red, red, Im, red, red cells red, stain red correspond to dead cells, and also we have much higher transfection efficiency uh, when we use this polyethylene amine, hyaluronic acid, uh, non-viral vectors compared to polyethylene amine. So these materials uh, can be uh, synthesized uh, using um, uh, synthetic polymer uh, chemistry techniques. Uh, they can be validated um, in vitro using different uh, cell culture uh, uh, systems. However, one of the biggest projects or the biggest 
uh, problem uh, and the biggest challenge uh, with this kind of uh, complexes is their delivery uh, because they rely on electrostatic uh, interactions for the complexation, for the formation of a polyplex between the polycationic uh, polymer and uh, the plasmid. It's very difficult to deliver and for this reason uh, new techniques have been developed in many laboratories to develop uh, means to deliver these uh, complexes for a therapeutic effect. One such technique is from our laboratory that's reported recently in the literature that involves the use of coaxially electrospan fibers that can be used as a scaffold for the culture of cells, but also for the control release of these complexes. And what is the innovation in this particular system is that one can separate, can load separately the uh, polycationic uh, polymer within the cell of the fiber using coaxial electrospinning and also load the plasmid within uh, the core of the uh, fiber. So one can use a very hydrophobic polymer as a shell for the fiber and a very hydrophilic polymer as a, a core. One can, can load and deliver separately both the plasmid and the polycationic polymer and as these components are released to the surrounding medium, they complex, they form uh, a, a polyplex and this polyplex that is formed following their delivery can uh, transfect um, uh, surrounding cells. There are many other systems that are reported by other laboratories that involve similar um, uh, systems for the uh, release of the different uh, components of the polyplex and their assemble, assembly following uh, their release for the transfection of um, uh, cells and tissues. I should say that um, uh, the early efforts in uh, tissue engineering uh, have uh, focused on the use of uh, prefabricated uh, polymer uh, scaffolds whose morphologies shown here. Uh, fabricated by techniques that we discussed earlier in the presentation, electrospinning or other techniques that one can make scaffolds with very control architectures. However, in recent years, uh, there has been great interest also in the use of injectable in situ uh, forming scaffolds that can be introduced into the body uh, with minimal surgical intervention. So one can use uh, materials that can uh, polymerize uh, in the body in the presence of cells, in the presence of bioactive molecules, materials that will conform to the shape of the defect and materials that will release uh, cells and factors uh, for uh, tissue regeneration. This is an example of such a material. Uh, it's an unsaturated uh, polyester. It's an alternating uh, copolymer of uh, uh, fumaric acid and uh, polyethylene glycol because of the unsaturated uh, uh, double bond along the macromolecular chain, the material can cross-link and polymerize. And um, uh, here we have an example of the polymerization of such a material in the presence of mesenchymal stem cells and the culture of these uh, constructs of uh, hydrogels with encapsulated uh, uh, cells uh, uh, for a period of uh, 28 days. So what one sees is that the cells not only survive the encapsulation process, the chemical reaction at 37 degrees uh, Celsius, but as the cells mineralize, the cells differentiate and produce extracellular matrix that is mineralized as shown here in this histological uh, section uh, that is uh, stained with uh, Van Kassa staining. Now, cell encapsulation is not a new technology in bioengineering. Uh, cell encapsulation has been used traditionally for immunoisolation. We are not using cell encapsulation for immunoisolation. The materials that are, we are using for cell encapsulation are degradable materials. They do not provide any immunoisolation. However, they are used to immobilize uh, the cells and bioactive molecules locally uh, within um, a defect. Another example of the use of such biomaterials for cartilage tissue engineering is shown uh, here. When one encapsulates uh, cells by themselves, the encapsulated cells do not have the ability to proliferate and secrete extracellular matrix. If the hydrogen, unless the hydrogen degrades at a rate that's comparable to the ECM production. However, one can incorporate uh, materials such as drug delivery systems, gelatin microparticles that can release growth factors such as TGF beta 1. That TGF beta 1 can result in overexpression of matrix metalloproteinases by the cells to facilitate the degradation of uh, gelatin and the 
generation of porosity that will allow the proliferation and uh, uh, deposition of more extracellular matrix. So hydrogel system, injectable systems can be used not only for the delivery of uh, cells, but also for the localized delivery of cells and bioactive uh, molecules. Now, this is ideal uh, for the engineering of complex anisotropic tissues, such as articular cartilage, because one can deposit uh, different layers of different compositions of different cell types and different bioactive molecules, again, in an effort to regenerate osteochondral uh, tissue. One can deliver uh, cells and factors for the regeneration of um, a bone um, a tissue, but also the right uh, factors or combination of factors for the regeneration of the cartilage tissue as part of an effort to regenerate an osteochondral <coughs> defect that spans not only the cartilage uh, layer, but uh, also the uh, bone uh, layer. And there have been many studies in uh, our laboratory and many other uh, laboratories uh, trying to use uh, these uh, uh, systems, these um, injectable systems for the uh, special delivery of uh, bioactive molecules and uh, cells, again, for the regeneration of anisotropic tissues such as osteochondral uh, uh, tissue. Now, I'm going uh, uh, to shift uh, gears and for the next uh, five minutes uh, share with you uh, our uh, progress uh, within another regenerative uh, medicine um, uh, effort. Uh, this is within the Armed Forces Institute of Regenerative Medicine. Uh, the Armed Forces Institute of Regenerative Medicine is a huge investment uh, by the DOD, NIH, and many other federal agencies of the order of $250 million. There are offer of 40 uh, uh, institutions and um, hundreds of uh, scientists involved uh, to develop uh, strategies that will accelerate uh, regenerative uh, solutions for the treatment of uh, warriors coming uh, back uh, from Iraq and Afghanistan. And some of the problems, some of the defects, uh, the, some of the injuries of uh, uh, the warriors coming back uh, from Iraq and Afghanistan involve the loss of not a single tissue, not bone tissue or skin tissue, but uh, combination of tissues. So we have loss of bone tissue, muscle, uh, cartilage, uh, uh, nerve that many times the integration or the combination of the existing technologies for the regeneration of the individual tissues will not work well for a composite tissue. So there is a great need to develop uh, technologies that will address defects, uh, composite tissue defects. But the other problem that we're trying to address with some of these defects is infection. So most of these defects are highly infections, infected, and the infection affects, uh, adversely affect any regenerative uh, medicine uh, strategy. So in collaboration uh, with uh, clinicians, uh, our laboratory is trying to develop uh, materials that can be used as part of a stage regenerative medicine strategy that will involve the regeneration of soft tissue and uh, heart tissue. And uh, the stages that we're pursuing is uh, first the regeneration of uh, soft tissue using a material that we call a space maintainer that will essentially uh, provide, f maintain uh, the space that eventually will be used for reconstruction of bone tissue prevent the collapse of the soft tissue, and at the same time uh, deliver uh, locally antibiotics that are needed uh, for um, infection. Uh, we're now in the uh, fourth uh, year of uh, the uh, uh, project. The initial goal for a firm uh, was uh, for uh, five years, and the success criterion for a firm uh, was uh, to treat a single uh, patient in the, during the course of uh, uh, five uh, years. And I'm uh, very uh, pleased to report to you that after uh, three and a half years, there are over a dozen uh, clinical uh, trials now going within a firm for a number of indications, not only craniofacial indications, but also uh, long bone, uh, skin, uh, uh, and other uh, problems. So in our case, uh, we're developing materials that are based on polymethyl methacrylate. Polymethyl methacrylate is a currently regulated material in orthopedics and uh, dentistry. And what we're doing is that we're investigating how the porosity of polymethyl methacrylate can be used to, uh, to facilitate the healing of the soft tissue. 
So we're using a rabbit model in the mandible. Uh, this is a bicortical uh, 10 millimeter defect in the rabbit. Uh, there is a two to three millimeter notch in the superior border of the uh, defect that allows communication between the mandibular region and the oral uh, cavity. And we use porous materials to maintain uh, the, uh, this uh, region, to fill this region. And we investigated the effect of the porosity on the healing of the soft tissue, the oral mucosa. So here you can see the results of the implantation after 12 weeks. In the case of porous methylmethacrylate, we saw enhanced healing as shown here. However, in the case of the non-porous polymethylmethacrylate, we have extrusion of the uh, implant and uh, wound dehiscence. So obviously this is a case of failure. Uh, this is a case of success. And uh, I'm very pleased to inform you that uh, currently there are uh, patients that uh, are being uh, uh, part of a clinical uh, uh, study at the uh, University of um, uh, Texas, uh, MD Anderson uh, Cancer, uh, at the University of Texas Health Science Center uh, in Houston under the guidance of uh, Dr. Mark uh, Wong, the chair of World Maxillofacial Surgery Department at that um, institution. What is very appealing uh, to us using um, uh, porous polymethyl methacrylate is that in addition to the enhanced uh, uh, soft tissue healing is that one, can use this material is in a porous form to deliver antibiotics. Using non-porous polymethyl methacrylate because of the hydrophobicity of the polymer, uh, any uh, antibiotic that is loaded to within uh, the uh, polymer remains within the bulk of the polymer and uh, only a very small fraction is released to the surrounding medium. Having a porous matrix that uh, we can uh, release most of the antibiotics to the surrounding uh, tissue. Again, this material is not a scaffold for tissue regeneration. This material is used temporarily to fill this space until the soft tissue heals. And once the soft tissue heals and the, uh, the infection is eradicated, then this material is removed. And then this area can be filled with a scaffolding material for uh, bone regeneration. So closing my presentation, uh, the message that I try to communicate uh, to you is that uh, biomaterials can be used uh, in, different, in tissue engineering strategies uh, in uh, many different roles. Uh, they can be used as uh, scaffolds for three-dimensional uh, culture and transplantation. They can be used as uh, conduits uh, to guide uh, tissue formation and regeneration. Uh, they can be used as uh, stimulants uh, for a desired cellular response. They can be used as substrates for targeted cell adhesions. Uh, very excitingly, they can be used as uh, carriers for the control release of uh, bioactive molecules, including differentiation factors, angiogenic factors, etc. They can be used as non-viral vectors uh, for uh, gene delivery, and also they can be used as uh, uh, space maintainers uh, as part of a stage regenerative uh, medicine uh, strategy. Uh, with that, I would like to close my presentation. I would like the, to acknowledge the generous support of NIH for during my entire uh, uh, career and also acknowledge uh, the recent support from the Armed Forces Institute of Regenerative Medicine for our efforts within uh, that um, institute. But most importantly, I would like uh, to thank all the students, uh, current and past students, and our collaborations for their significant uh, contributions to the work that I presented to you today. With that, I would like to close my talk, and thank you again for this great honor. of questions, we would have time. Uh, and just to remind everybody that after the question and answer session, there will be um, in the library just outside this auditorium uh, reception for Dr. Mikus if you would like to talk to him in person. So anyway, are there some questions? Yes, please. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the very informative talk. Uh, and uh, the only question, uh, it's a basic question. Uh, how do you control the loading of cells uh, in the three-dimensional micro or uh, nanofibers? into the different layers of uh, these fibers? That's an excellent question. Um, there have been many different uh, seeding methods that uh, have been uh, proposed by us and uh, uh, many others. Uh, some of the methods uh, may involve the application of a vacuum. Uh, some of the methods may involve the application of flow. 
Uh, the only comment that I would make is that as the concentration of nanofibers increases, the penetration and the seeding of cells within the construct decreases. Uh, because the available space uh, for uh, the transport and migration of uh, cells uh, is uh, limited, and that's the reason once he, one has to apply mechanical means such as uh, suction or uh, flow to force the cells essentially within the pores of the scaffold. How does the material polyfumarate compares with the other biodegradable material? The, uh, there have been many biodegradable materials uh, proposed over the years by many laboratories. Uh, one of the unique advantages of uh, the polypropylene fumarates that uh, myself and Dr. Yazemski uh, developed and investigated uh, over the years is that the ability uh, to uh, polymerize the material in situ as part of an injectable formulation uh, because of the unsaturated uh, uh, double bonds. And also, uh, another advantage of the material is uh, the high mechanical properties of the uh, material compared to other um, available uh, materials. Uh, for example, uh, there have been materials uh, with excellent mechanical properties, polymers with excellent mechanical properties. Many times, uh, the um, the enhancement in mechanical properties is related to the increase in the degree of crystallinity. Uh, the cr crystalline materials are great in terms of mechanical performance. Uh, however, the increase in crystallinity can res result in increased inflammatory response after implantation. One of the advantages of this material is that it is uh, uh, amorphous, so it doesn't have crystalline domains. Now, uh, at the price. Uh, one of the uh, disadvantages of this material is that it degrades very slowly. It can be ideal for situations where uh, slow degradation is desired, but these materials are not going to degrade uh, within a uh, couple of weeks. A short question regarding the formation of the extracellular matrix from yes. the mesenchymal stem cell. You suggested that you are using the cell implanted to make the scaffold materials. So what is the composition of the extracellular matrix made by the mesenchymal stem cell you are using? Well, the, com the main components of the extracellular matrix that is generated by the mesenchymal stem cells is uh, collagen, glycosaminoglycans, and we have um, small amounts, very small amounts of the bioactive molecules that are important uh, mediators in uh, tissue regeneration. So we can uh, characterize the presence of uh, members of the TGF beta superfamily and other angiogenic uh, factors and their expression uh, during uh, the formation of uh, uh, these constructs in response to uh, fluid flow conditions. Thank you. Uh, it's my impression that engineering is a combination of empiricism and experimental and um, uh, theory-based design. Um, so I can't tell, I don't know this field very well, I can't tell from your talk how much of this is basically uh, advancement uh, based on previous experience with particular materials was something which is based in some basic understanding of how these materials work. So, so it's a two-part question. If the latter is the case, or there's a need for the latter, what areas would you like to see developed in, let's say, material science, which you think would significantly advance uh, the field uh, at this point? Well, that's an excellent point, and thank you for the opportunity to clarify. Uh, very significant engineering, significant uh, uh, theoretical uh, work behind the development of these materials. Uh, obviously, as with major discoveries in many fields, there is, everything started, to, started with uh, empirical uh, work. Uh, however, uh, material science is not an empirical uh, discipline. Uh, and uh, we can now predict, uh, based on molecular modeling, based on uh, uh, use of um, uh, uh, numerical simulations and uh, other theoretical frameworks, the uh, properties of uh, materials and the relationship between uh, structure and uh, uh, property. For example, one can predict uh, the mechanical properties of materials, one can predict the diffusive properties of materials, and one can predict the degradation characteristics of these materials. If you ask me what is the, in the bomb materials field, uh, what is the uh, biggest uh, challenge, uh, I would say that uh, the biggest uh, challenge is to uh, predict the biological performance 
of a bow material in vivo based on in vitro measurements. In other words, I mean, uh, we can uh, predict very reproducibly what happens to the material uh, in vitro uh, when it's play material placed in a sim simulated body fluid, when the material interacts with other proteins, etc. However, the environment in vivo is so complex that many times we cannot predict the performance of the material because of the not complete understanding of all the mechanisms of what happens in vivo. Uh, it's a very interdisciplinary uh, undertaking. Absolutely. Is the community properly organized to uh, make progress in this way? Where, where does this basic science, for example, take place? Does it take place in a tissue engineering department or a chemistry department or physics department? It's a very interdisciplinary field, and I can tell you that um, it takes place in um, engineering, in uh, chemical engineering, in mechanical engineering, even electrical engineering. Uh, some departments, some universities have a material science department uh, within uh, mechanical engineering. That's the experience at RISE. Other, depart other universities have standalone materials engineering uh, departments. Uh, in terms of the uh, basic science, there is a lot of uh, uh, tissue engineering research in uh, uh, biology and uh, biochemistry something that uh, uh, we're doing in collaboration with um, uh, colleagues at MD Anderson Cancer Center that I didn't present in my presentation, is that we're using uh, tissue engineering models of tumors for drug discovery. So there is great interest in the basic sciences in using uh, uh, tissue analogs that are created uh, using tissue engineering uh, principles for toxicology studies or to test and screen uh, different uh, chemotherapeutics. Uh, I would say that uh, the field of tissue engineering is highly interdisciplinary. Uh, I'm uh, very honored to serve as the editor-in-chief of tissue engineering and seeing the publications uh, that are published in tissue engineering. They come not only from engineering uh, departments, but from basic science departments and also clinical departments. Thanks. Let's uh, thank the speaker one more time and uh, welcome to the reception. <laughs>